Welcome to today's masterclass. My name is Lisa Richter and I will be your host today. On the off chance that you don't know about CSIA, we are a global nonprofit trade association with over 500 member companies in 35 countries. For system integrator members, the CSIA best practices manual and CSIA certification are some of the more popular member benefits but you will also enjoy a variety of others, including professional development, learning from your peers, and access to professional services experts, including insurance, financial, and legal, who understand the SI's unique business needs. For partner members, CSIA offers an ecosystem to grow your SI programs, understand your customers' pain points, monitor industry trends, and share your thought leadership. With thousands of qualified integrators and suppliers, the CSIA Industrial Automation Exchange helps SIs, industry suppliers, and manufacturers connect and do business. For SIs and partners, it provides a platform to support your content and SEO marketing efforts, position yourself as a thought leader, and nurture prospects during their complicated buyer's journey. And the good news is that now is actually the best time of the year to join because as of October 1, companies that join will get the rest of 2021 as well as all of 2022 included in their membership dues and any exchange upgrades or packages. You can get all the details at www.controlsys.org shine. At this time, I would like to introduce today's speakers, Kevin and John. Guys, take it away. John, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Been a crazy day, everybody. Thanks for all who have joined us today. And uh, Kevin and I are going to take you through some case studies as well as some live hands on um, configuration of communication and connectivity. But this is about saying yes, where maybe you used to say no to uh, integrating devices. Software Toolbox is a company we've been digitally transforming for 25 years. Started with PLCs, drives, then we had people, we were helping integrate databases, business data sources, then other sorts of devices that weren't PLCs. And these days, IoT, MQTT, Azure, Google, if it has an interface in it that's digital, people are going to want that data. So. I'm gonna first go through several of our products. Most of those, so I'm gonna give you a quick intro, then I'm gonna get in some case studies. The first one is the magic eye chart, the zoo of industrial automation devices. Um, I wish I could say this was everything in the industry, but this is just a fraction probably of the stuff. But that's where Kevin's gonna come in and, and talk about how we, we deal with the rest of it. But all I, I'm sure all of you as integrators have probably run across I bet if you look to those of you with some experience, have probably done at least five, if not 10 of these device types at some point. Our solution for integrating these products is a tool called Top Server. It's a OPC DA UA server that's a single application with multiple drivers that can plug in, that plug in and talk to different types of devices, as well as can aggregate data from legacy DDE servers and OPC servers. I just came from a presentation about the history of OPC and there were people in it that had never seen DDE, didn't realize it's still out there. Still people that have, that's their way to get data. Well, we can modernize those and then bring them up to all sorts of applications. This happens to be a little bit of a Viva centric uh, from where this slide came from, but we work with all, all types of vendors, but we've done a lot with the Aviva world. Most of you know that is Wonderware. One other product, and then I'm going to get in some case studies here, is Cogent Data Hub. Uh, Cogent Data Hub is a multi, we call it our multi-tool of data integration because it starts with just OPC UA, DA, as well as alarms and events and alarms and conditions, but then brings in reading, writing from databases, uh, Modbus, Excel, cameras, uh, custom applications, 
moving data between different segments of the network, between sites, without, um, without even having to open firewall ports through a unique way of doing uh, uh, some proxy friendly and DMZ friendly moving of data and the use of DMZs that are growing, growing in popularity as there are more and more cyber issues. So let's talk about some applications because I could sit here and go through all the features of Data Hub. Much better to just look at some applications. If you go to our website, one of the first links on the page is over to about 30 different applications where real customer stories. I'm gonna cover a few of those here. First one, I'm gonna take you on a journey to Windhoek, Namibia on the Southwest coast of Africa. Um, if you've ever seen the pictures of these beautiful orange sand dunes um, in the area called Sassasvle along the West coast, it's beautiful, but it's dry, but it's also very sunny as you see here. Um, and that's the picture brewery roof that is covered in solar panels. There's a problem though, there's a coal fired plant about a half mile away. We'll talk about how they have to deal with that in a moment. It's also a natural place that unfortunately, like a lot of places in the world, has had invasive species of plants. What you see here chipped up are trees that are an invasive species they're trying to get rid of. And maybe a brewing pays farmers to chop those down and bring them to them. They grind them up and use them to generate power or and actually use these to generate steam. This is part of how they, uh, one of the ways they can power their steam boiler, which of course in brewing, you need to clean things. So in this application, they use top server to connect to all their IT as well as power infra monitoring infrastructure, as well as their Siemens control systems, as well as Modbus in the utilities. The interesting part about that uh, solar farm is they also use the web view capabilities in Cogent Data Hub, and they built pages that they can use to monitor and display the effectiveness of the solar panels. Because guess what? They get dirty. And you think it would be uniform? No, it's not. They, but they get dirty from the output of that coal-fired plant, depending on which way the wind's blowing. And this basically tells them when they need to send somebody up on the roof to go clean off the solar panels because they actually see the output drop. They also integrated into uh, Brewmax DCS as well as an SAP system using Data Hub as well as a Wonderware historian. Um, this is the type of example of how we work with people when they have problems where they're trying to pull things together and they realize they're, they, what they have doesn't necessarily gonna do it. And we come in with our, or we call ourselves the MacGyvers of communication. We come in with a, a whole raft of tools and work with them to figure out what's gonna be the right way to use standards-based tools that integrate cleanly and with their DCS, PLC and HMI to, to solve problems. Uh, this application's won three awards at uh, Aviva Wonderware conferences since it was implemented about six years ago. Let's move over to uh, modular process automation, the DCS world and air separation. Uh, we've done a lot of work in uh, compressed air with pretty much all the major compressed air vendors in the U.S. and some you wouldn't have heard of in other parts of the world. This is an application where they were using a, a technique that I'm certainly no expert on called modular process automation to manage how the startups happen. And in this case, they have a Delta V and a Foxborough DCS. The plant DCS has an OPC DA server the PK controller, which I think was the Delta V, had a UA server, and they needed to bridge data between them and have logic in that bridging. Um, they were looking at writing a custom application to do this with a toolkit and instead chose to use Data Hub um, and its ability to bridge data, as well as to do some scripting for the, some of the more advanced logic. So they ended up with a solution instead of all custom it was 95% off the shelf and 5% with built-in scripting. The end result when they implemented this is they reduced startup time on an Argon ASU from two hours to 45 minutes. Pretty significant savings. You can read more about that at uh, the URL shown here. Okay, let's switch over to control system startups. Um, 
this was an application that, frankly, when the user told me about his results, I, I didn't believe it. It was a too good to be true. I said, Rudy, yeah, man, how, how'd you do this? And I'm going to give you a place where you can learn about that on the next slide. Hint, get your phones ready if you want to pop up a Q, grab a QR code. Um, but their goal was to minimize downtime because they were switching over from an old Modbus serial PLCs to a new Mitsubishi PLC with a new version of their HMI. And this mill, downtime is a grain mill, was extraordinarily expensive. And they were expecting to have to be down 30 days. Working with our team, they used Data Hub to tunnel and bridge data in a way that allowed them to do the checkout of the entire new system while running the old one. And you go, how do you do that? You eventually have to exercise the IO. Well, rather than try to spend a whole webinar on that, you can go to this page, you can snap that with your phone if you want. And uh, as you can see where I highlighted, we asked Rudy Fandemerva to explain this in his own words. And so these bullet points, there's nine of them where he went through force and wrote it out step-by-step step what he did. And it's fascinating, uh, hats off to uh, the ingenuity and cleverness. We just made the product that empowered him, Rudy Fandemerva uh, with Motiontronics uh, was the clever one. Okay, now let's switch gears to Linux and COBOL. Yeah, you thought COBOL was dead. This is a company, Task Force Tips in Indiana that makes firefighting equipment. And they had a robotic picker and an old PLC on it that they were going to replace. And their system that decided what needed to be picked and when was running on a Linux box. It was a COBOL program and there was no way they were going to rewrite it. Fortunately, the commands were in a database. So what they did was they used Data Hub to connect into the database, receive the commands there, and then Data Hub, because once you get data into the Data Hub, it's just data. It's just a point. Who cares where it came from? We can send it anywhere. In this case, they sent it out through an Allen Bradley OPC server down to the new Control Logix PLC. So they didn't have to write any code to implement this, this uh, improvement, yet they're dealing with Linux, databases, and OPC, and Rockwell. All right, so there's four use cases of Data Hub, as I mentioned. There's at least 20 more on the website. Um, the idea is between our core OPC server, top server and data hub, there's an awful lot we can do to help people stay out of the custom code business. There's a tool for that. I wanna switch over, cover one more tool, then I introduce what Kevin's gonna do. And then it's party time when Kevin goes live. So, this is a different tool and you go data hub and OPC router. Well, you know, one of the things about software toolbox, I founded this company 25 years ago, this past July, our first paper catalog shipped, mailed out. I forget how many tens of thousands of them this month, probably this week, 25 years ago was we wanted to bring together a lot of different solutions because every integration problem is different. It may be a database in a Rockwell PLC. And I bet if you pick five projects with a database in Rockwell PLC, there's gonna be something different about all five. So rather than be a one trick pony, we felt that we could be the most consultative and provide those value if we try different ways to solve problems. So let's talk about problems that we need to solve. And hopefully we'll have a tool that can help you. And if not, well, we'll probably tell you somewhere to go if we know somebody that has one. Um, but we're not constrained to trying to force fit something. So OPC router, like Data Hub, it's a DA and UA client, but I like to highlight what's different. One of the things that you may see, particularly on machinery from Europe, is this subset of OPC UA called methods. A UA method is like calling a function call on a UA server where you pass in parameters and the, OP, and the machine then does something. Well, I have a case study I'm going to talk about that needed that. Um, the other thing is integrating with SAP. Although SAP is a UA client, there's a lot of um, different ways to talk to SAP that um, 
that may or may not um, be what you have. And when we brought this product on a few years ago, I didn't realize how many ways there were to connect to SAP. I'd heard of SAP HANA as a database, didn't in-memory database, didn't know how to integrate with it. Well, that's one of the things OPC Router is really good at. It also has IoT connect connections and can integrate with REST and SOAP web services. You know, there's a lot of tools that do RESTful web service integration. Um, if you're newer to the industry, SOAP was Microsoft's attempt to say, yeah, yeah, we're gonna do web services better. Well, they begrudgingly eventually accepted REST. And SOAP is kind of a heavy web service protocol where REST is pretty simple and light, simple, light and cross-platform kind of dominated, but there's still a lot of systems and OPC router can connect to those. So uh, you can see the names of uh, some of the folks we've worked with here. I saw something in chat. Uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if that person's with uh, that customer, but thanks for joining us. We appreciate you and uh, your application. But the biggest thing in router is that, that we found helpful is this visual workflow engine. Here's an example where we implemented an OPC UA method on the UA server in OPC router. So not just calling UA methods, we can do that, but also implement methods that then triggered some actions to occur in a database and something to happen in a printer, as well as cut with data coming from the method trigger and database data. This ability to visually build up the flows is, uh, has proven very valuable to a lot of those customers. And most of the applications of router, it's an amalgamation of data that they were scratching their heads going, how are we gonna do this without a custom app? Reality is you could combine OPC router with data hub with top server. Just depends on what you're doing um, in the application. And that's where our team comes in. Of course, you see that template and that was a simple one. Simple one. And you go, well, what if I have a bunch of them and they're the same? Well, a really powerful capability is templatized configuration. You can eat, build templates for connections, for workflows. And then you can even use the database to trigger creating instances of those. Um, we've seen, what I think there's one of those clients on that prior page that's actually doing that. They do some things and write into a SQL database and OPC router configures itself for a particular uh, uh, setup. Um, pretty advanced, um, you know, de definitely worked with our team on that, but uh, you know, it's the kind of thing for an integrator, um, you know, you can do some really powerful things and, and have your engineers put their, their ingenuity into leveraging the, these technologies that empower versus writing custom code. So this isn't the customer that chimed on in, in a, a, a chat, if they are here, but this is a different one where they had a vision system. This is a film line out in Iowa at a, a company that makes, makes films, obviously. And they had this vision system they brought in from Germany. And the way you had to pass the setup to the vision system for what it needed to inspect, what the tolerances were, et cetera, you called OPC UA methods to do that. When they needed to integrate that with their uh, G prophecy HMI, but they didn't want to have to go in and make super big changes. It's really a wild one here. They also wanted to use an existing DA server connection that they had. Well, they ended up using our combination of our Omni server that they already had running and created kind of an in-memory space there. And some things that they uh, write. So what they do is the OPC router subscribes to data points they set up in the Omni server. Their HMI writes a trigger item and recipe ID and then the OPC router goes and calls the vision system method and transmits the necessary data that it's gotten from the HMI down to the vision system and resets the trigger. So there's all this coordination that went on and they did this without writing any custom code. Um, a version of this was actually written up in ISA Tech Magazine back in February. Okay, so we've talked about PLC drivers, data hub, routing, visual config, SAP. I now wanna tee Kevin up because this is where the real fun comes. Let's talk about the animals in the zoo. 
that aren't your typical PLCs that you saw on my second slide. These are just some examples of them. I think we all know that there are devices out there that support Ethernet, the various flavors of serial connectivity, the various protocols you can run over Ethernet, and they come with a little book. It used to be paper. These days it's PDF. But it gives you information like this that you look at and go, I can't do that with a Modbus OPC server. I can't do that with Ethernet IP and my RS links. How am I going to talk to that? Well, the place we've all gone, and this takes me back to 31 years ago at GE FANUC Tech Support, we'd say, oh, no problem. We have this ASCII basic module on the PLC. You can just use the basic language and implement that protocol and talk out a serial board, put the data into some registers in the PLC, and away you go. Yeah, we all did that for a long time. What if you want to get it directly to the, to, up to the uh, PLC? Yeah. Well, OmniServer is our solution for this. It's an OPC DA and UA server. Works great with Viva, but also works great with inductive automation. Ignition's product, pretty much anything that supports OPC UA and DA. Kevin's going to show you the visual configuration of how this is built. So I just show you the infographic to help you orient that you know, that's where this thing sits between all these leftover devices and the uh, HMI. Like I did with Data Hub, I want to run through a few use cases and then hand it over to Kevin so uh, he can get hands on. He, he has uh, an amalgamation of things he's going to talk to over there uh, to his right that I know about. The first one is label and printer applicator control. Done a lot with this one. Uh, this was in Forest Products. You had um, some pre existing control from the PLCs but they wanted to integrate the print control directly into the HMI and send the print strings directly to the printer. The way they were doing this was they were sending it down to the uh, uh, IO server, to a PLC and out that basic module in the PLC. What they, it was kind of a roundabout way. And the problem is they could only do basic print commands and somebody had to reprogram the PLC if they wanted to change or add anything. It worked, got the job done. But in the new system, InTouch talks, and this could be, any, again, any HMI out there could do this, talks directly to OmniServer, and OmniServer's been configured to send those print screens. So what happens is those print strings, variables from the HMI of what needs to go on the label gets sent down into tags in the OmniServer. The OmniServer's been pre-configured and knows about those tags, and knows where to put them in the print message. Sends it directly out, went straight Ethernet, and did some modernization. And now if they need to add anything, they just go in the Omni server and do it. They don't have to go mess with the PLC to do that. Uh, this also, because there's fewer pieces, much faster troubleshooting. Um, typically, all of this runs on the same machine. So, I just realized the chat was shared. Sorry about that. I'm doing a dual screen thing here. Um, so um, typically the HMI and OmniServer are on the same computer. So you got one place, one screen to do all your troubleshooting. Let's talk about weight data acquisition and sausage. Odom's Tennessee Pride Sausage. Well, they had two processing facilities where collecting of accurate weight data is essential. And they had some GSE scales. And they wanted, wanted to do something unique. They wanted to allow operators to see the weight data on the InTouch HMI, but at the same time see that data go um, directly into a SQL database. They didn't want to have it go all the way up to the HMI because what if the HMI went down? What happens when there's Windows updates? They needed that data to go straight to SQL also. Um, you know, food processing, you, you have to have these, these uh, really good records. Well, what they did was they used the OmniServer Pro version, which includes the ability to log that data. So what happens is the OmniServer gets the data from the scale, it parses it into items, sends it to InTouch, and sticks it in SQL all at the same time. So it's, it's just sending it two places, 
same, uh, at the same time, this eliminated some manual data entry that was going on in their applications. All right, enough of food. Let's switch over to institutional facilities. And integrators probably may figure out what these are, because, but uh, we've done a lot in, with OmniServer. In this case, they needed to control a phone and intercom system. And they wanted to integrate it into InTouch and not have to run additional software. So they wanted to be able to send these key commands down to this telecore system. Um, now I'll give you a hint, these institutions also have a lot of cameras and they have doors that they open and close. Um, a lot of integrators use this tool, use OmniServer to integrate these things because guess what? They all don't talk Modbus and they all don't talk ethernet IP. They have their own serial and ethernet protocols. So in this one, in the new architecture, the implementation sends requests to the controller it also just gets data that just shows up from the controller and puts it in the right tags so that the uh, data then ends up in InTouch where, where they want it to be. Now, all done through a visual configuration. So the results were they don't have to use the control software from the manufacturer anymore, which eliminated training and maintenance. It also gave them a fair amount of operator efficiency because everything's now done in a single place versus, you know, the, the wall of screens. Um, so, all righty, one more here, and then we're going to get to Kevin. Um, Campbell's Soup, go in a store, pick up a can, look at the bottom of the can. I should have grabbed one out of my pantry. On the bottom of that can is, a bar, uh, is some text, a little 2D, almost barcode type thing, and a bunch of other data that gets printed on those, <clears throat> It's printed on those cans at 200 cans a minute. Well, every time they change, they have to do a setup change on this Leibinger printer. Well, they were doing that manually before. In this application, uh, working with the system integrator, um, they actually engaged us for some services to augment their team um, because we do this all the time, training customers how to use OmniServer to help them implement that protocol to do those printer setups. In the same application, they did uh, barcode printers, way bridges, way scales, barcode readers, basically all their end of line equipment and packaging got taken care of by OmniServer. And the end result was reducing change over time as part of a global MES application. So it's not just soup, there's Arnett's biscuits and cookies in Australia, Pepperidge Farm products. You know, Campbell's owns a lot of stuff. They came down here to Charlotte and bought up Lance Foods even. So, so there's some applications to, to kind of hopefully, in a way, you know, I don't want to drown, hope you're drowning, but in a way I hope you're going, oh, wow, the, these guys can do a lot of different things and, and we, you'd like to learn more. So let's turn over to Kevin and uh, it's party time, Kevin. So in honor of Bob Ziegenfuse, a long CSI member, I'm putting on my party hat from uh, his wife's birthday party this summer. So let me stop sharing and over to you, Kevin. All right, thanks, John. Um, yeah, so like John said, I'm gonna be connecting to a couple, a couple of those non-standard devices. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, you should be seeing my screen. Um, first thing I'm gonna do, I do need to switch my video because I'm gonna show you my setup for one of those devices. And I can't do it with two cameras going. So you can see here, um, I have a couple of products, one bourbon, one scotch and one beer, and my DataLogic uh, barcode scanner. I'm going to be showing you how to set up OmniServer, communicate with that DataLogic barcode scanner. Um, We'll scan those products and we'll be getting that information into um, a Viva InTouch via a sweet link connection and uh, ignition via an OPC UA connection. So I'm going to minimize that. Um, here's my Omni server. Before we get into the actual configuration of Omni server, we need to take a look at that protocol documentation that John mentioned that, that allows us to build a protocol in Omni server without code. So I'm going to bring up the PDF of my data logic manual for my barcode scanner. Uh, which happens to be a QD2100. Um, so what I'm looking for in this manual is information about the actual physical connection. 
Um, it is a USB scanner, but it does map to a virtual COM port. I'm also looking for information about the format uh, of the data that's going to be sent to OmniServer so that I know how to parse that correctly and put the barcode into an item. Uh, so the first thing I want to look at, uh, if I go to this section, when I first got this barcode scanner, and I have already done this, but I had to set it up to uh, map to a virtual USB COM port. So when I first got the scanner, I scanned this, and now my scanner appears as a COM port that OmniServer can access and treat um, the same as a serial COM port at that point. Um, so what I need to know also are what are the default COM parameters that I need to use in OmniServer to connect to that virtual um, COM port. So if I go to this, uh, there's a specific section that shows me the defaults in this manual, and I can see the baud rate defaults to 9600, eight data bits, one stop bit, no parity um, with handshaking disabled. So we're going to remember that information uh, for when we get to OmniServer because we'll use that to configure our COM device in OmniServer. Uh, also interested in the format of the data. So if I go to this section, it shows me um, there can be uh, a number of formats for the barcode data that's being sent by the scanner. Um, it can have prefixes, it can have label IDs, um, AIM IDs, the actual barcode data. So that stuff would precede the barcode data potentially. Um, a label ID potentially, and then a suffix or termination character. Um, so that's the possible formatting, but what's the default formatting? Uh, because I haven't made any changes to the configuration to add anything like a prefix or an AIM ID or a label ID or anything of that nature. So I want to go to a specific section that shows me the default, which is no global prefix um, and a global suffix or termination character of a carriage return or a hexadecimal zero D. So that tells me that the format from the barcode scanner is going to be the barcode followed by a carriage return. So at this point, I have the information I need to implement a protocol in OmniServer. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is go to my devices section in OmniServer and I'm going to configure a new device. So I need to know what COM port that device mapped to. So let me go to my device manager in Windows and we can see what virtual COM port that is mapped to. Under my ports, COM and LPT, you can see my barcode scanners mapped to COM3. So back over in OmniServer, I've got COM3 and the default parameters for serial connection on OmniServer just happened to, just happened to match the defaults for this scanner. 9600 baud, eight data bits, no parity, one stop bit. So we're going to save that and that's our that's our COM3 that we're going to use to communicate with the barcode scanner. Our next step is to create a protocol. So I'm going to create a new protocol and up comes my visual protocol editor. I'm just going to give this a name of DL underscore scanner. And the first thing we want to do is create an item um, that's going to receive that barcode that's coming from the barcode scanner. So I'm going to go to the item section. I'm going to click the plus sign to add a new item. And I'm going to call my item barcode for simplicity. We're going to make that string data type and we're going to make it read only because we're only going to be receiving data from the scanner and not, not writing data back to the scanner with this item. So once I have my item defined, I can go to my response only messages section. Um, and these, these, these types of messages are used when the device is going to send us data in an unsolicited fashion that we didn't have to send it a command for. So I'm gonna add a new response only message. And I'm just gonna call that receive barcode. And as we learn from our protocol documentation, um, it's the data we're going to receive is going to be the barcode value itself followed by a carriage return. So the first thing I want to build in my received section of this message is the item that I created. So I can drag that from the items section and add that to my received message. And then I want to add a carriage return, which I can find under the control sequences section. There's my carriage return. I'm going to drag one of those over to follow my item. Um, and at that point, our protocol is, is configured such that it'll receive the barcode from, from that data logic scanner. So I'm going to go to file and I'm going to save that. And I'm going to say yes to save the changes. So we can close out of the visual protocol editor. And uh, you can see there's my protocol that I just created. So the next step is to create a topic that's going to be accessible from any client application um, for accessing a specific device using a specific protocol. So I'm going to create a new topic. 
And the topic name is what's going to be specified in any client application for accessing that specific device. So I'm going to call this scanner. And I'm going to select the protocol that I just created. And I'm going to select my COM3 device that I just created. And then I'm going to save that. And at this point, that particular device with that particular protocol is ready to be connected to um, from um, Aviva InTouch and uh, inductive automation ignition SCADA. So before we go over to that portion, though, um, I'm also going to be connecting to a TPI vibration monitor that we have in our PLC lab in Charlotte. Um, so just to show you, since I don't since that I don't actually have that device here at my desk, I'm just going to show you what that looks like, and what we're going to be connecting to. I have a picture of that. You can see here. Let's see. So that's a 9038 TPI vibration monitor. That's the eight channel version. So it has um, inputs for eight separate channels of vibration sensors that would attach to that one. The one in our lab is actually a 9034, which has four channels. Uh, I mention that because in our Omni server for TPI bundle, we include protocols for both of those models um, that covers both the four channel and the eight channel version. So we're gonna be actually using the um, we're going to actually be using the, uh, the 9034 protocol. So if we go over to our protocol section, there's the TPI 9034 protocol. Um, if I open that up in the visual editor, I'll just give you a quick look um, at what that looks like. Uh, we have a lot more items in this. This is, this is a protocol um, that is command response, which means we send a command to the TPI vibration monitor and it sends us back data in response to that. Um, we can get the, uh, the BDU data um, for, for each of the channels. Um, and uh, we, can get the, we can get the current, the current values, the current G values, and a lot of the settings that are defined in that device. Um, command response messages are in this protocol because we need to send a request in order to get a response. Um, and all of this information came from a protocol document for that, for the TPI devices. Um, so, I'm going to go ahead and close out of that. So we need to create a topic for that device using that protocol as well. So I'm going to create a topic called TPI. And I'm going to use that TPI 9034 protocol. Um, and I'm actually, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to create a, an Ethernet device to connect to that device first. So um, I'm going to create a new Ethernet device, TCP as the transport. Uh, my IP address for that particular device is 192.168.111.197. And those devices default to a port of 9764. And I'm gonna click save. And now we can go back to creating our topic. Um, again, I'm gonna call that TPI. And we're gonna select the 9034 TPI protocol. And we're going to select that Ethernet device that I just created. And so I'm going to save that. And at this point, we're actually ready to do some configuration um, in InTouch and make our connection from Ignition. Um, so I'm going to jump over to my InTouch. And I already have a project created um, with some labels associated with it. For those labels, I'm actually going to add value displays to receive my scanned barcode and to receive the bearing damage units for channel one or the BDU value. So first, I'm going to add a text display. <laughs> and I'm just going to change the, and I'm going to add one for this one as well. And to make that easier to see, I'm actually going to update the font. just so that you don't have to squint to see those. Okay, so I'm gonna double click on my barcode value display. We're gonna do a value display type of string and barcode to match the item that's gonna receive that barcode. If I click okay, I'm gonna then define that item. 
and that's going to be a type of IO message. We're going to make that read only to match our item and Omni server. And we're going to use the tag name as the item name. And for the access name, um, I already happen to have um, access names defined. So we'll open this up. Um, the application, the sweet link application name is OSRV POLL for Omni server. Um, that allows sweet link clients to connect to Omni server. And the topic name matches the topic name that we defined in, um, in Omni server. So scanner for simplicity. Again, the protocol sweet links. So we're going to click OK, close. And at that point, that value display is ready to go. So I'm going to close out of that. And the next thing we want to set up is our TPI um, BDUs for channel one. So we're going to make this one um, an analog value display. And uh, we're going to put in the item name BDU value channel two. And that one's going to be a real data type. We're going to click OK, and then we want to define that. And that's going to be an IO real. And use tag name is item name. And for the access name, I have an access name for TPI here. Um, again, the application name is OSRV Paul P O L L. Um, is a service name that's going to allow SweetLink clients to access Omni server. Topic name needs to match the topic that was defined that marries together the specific protocol and device in Omni server, um, which happens to be TPI. And we're again the protocol is SweetLink, so I'm going to click OK, close, and then we're going to save that. And at this point, I'm going to save my project, and we can go to runtime. Runtime is where the fun time is, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, you might want to think about, you know, George Thorogood and the Destroyers, and Kevin's going to do some fun here. Yeah, so let me bring my um, Omni server back up, and I actually want to show you, I want to show you one of the handy tools in Omni server called the IO Monitor. And we're going to select our COM3. And this is going to allow us to see the raw data that's coming in from the barcode scanner. And then you'll see the value as it gets displayed and in touch. At the same time, though, I actually want to bring up my camera so you can see what I'm scanning. And let me try to strategically place things here so that you can see everything. I've got a lot going on here. So, <laughs> all right. So if I go over to my setup here, I'm going to scan one bourbon. And you'll see the raw data there was the raw string barcode followed by a zero D hex, which is a character term. So that's one bourbon, one scotch. You see the value change and one beer. <laughs> So maybe um, you're saying, folks, maybe you're saying on, on. Your one, one bourbon, bourbon, one scotch, one and one scotch beer. And one beer. <laughs> so as you can see here in InTouch, um, that value changed pretty much instantaneously as I was scanning that. You can see the BDUs on our TPI vibration monitor have been changing periodically. Um, if you know anything about vibrations, the bearing, bearing damage units tells you the state of the bearings and uh, the higher that number is um, and worse state that bearing is. So that's what's going to cause your vibrations is when there are imperfections in that bearing and it's damaged. So that's why you're not seeing that change a whole lot um, because, it, yeah, because there's not a lot of vibration going on um, with the, uh, the channel that that's attached to. But you can see it changing periodically. So last but not least, um, I want to switch over to my ignition so you can see um, basically the same thing there. I already have this one pre-configured for the purposes of time. Um, in the ignition gateway, I have an OPC UA um, secure connection set up to connect to this same Omni server. Um, and I have a value display in ignition that's, that's receiving that barcode as well um, and the BDUs. So if I go to tools and I'm going to launch my project. 
Um, the cool thing about ignition, as you can see, it actually displays the value changes um, even in design mode without having to go um, to live production mode. But we'll go ahead and do that for completeness so you can see what that looks like. Sign in. And let's take it a second here. All right. So let me shrink this down a little bit so we can get everything on the same page here. And again, I'll go back over to my setup here. And we'll again do one bourbon, one scotch, and one beer. <laughs> and pardon me, I didn't expand, I didn't expand that particular text display, so it's cutting that off just a little bit. So that's that's my uh, configuration um, issue, but uh, you could see that value was changing. Um, as we went, and you can see for every one of those scans back in OmniServer, uh, we had the raw data um, with the barcode followed by a carriage return. Uh, so that's that's a basic, um, in a nutshell, connection to both a, a command response protocol and an unsolicited protocol, um, just to show you how easy it is to get those types of devices connected up to your OPC and your suite link and even your DDE clients. Um, and uh, there's no limit on having multiples of those client connections connected at the same time. As you can see, we had a suite link connection and an OPC UA connection simultaneously. Um, and, and those are working. And by no means, these, these are some relatively straightforward and, and basic protocols, um, but by no means um, is OmniServer limited to just um, these types of protocols. It can do some fairly advanced stuff as well. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna switch back over to the slides so we can do a little, show you a little bit of how we can help you get started um, with all of our solutions, including OmniServer. Um, so, so how can we help? So for all of our products, um, the ones that John showed you, um, OmniServer, other solutions that we just didn't have time to show you today, um, we can actually do a lot. Um, even 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 pre-sales. Um, we provide uh, free trials um, and extended trials for proof of concepts. Um, if you get with us uh, when you're working on a project or a specific application, um, we can talk to you about um, the architecture of the system, um, any challenges or constraints that we see might be the case based off of that architecture, um, and just basically do a general review of your application um, to make, your, make sure you're putting the best foot forward um, and implementing and configuring things um, in our solutions to the best um, best way possible using uh, best practices um, for those particular solutions. Um, we offer expert assistance um, through initial tests, um, those proof of concepts. Um, and of course, um, if you purchase the licenses for any of those solutions, um, you'll, get our, you'll get our technical support as well. Um, we even offer success assurance services um, when you need an extra level of, of hands-on consulting um, and support for those, for those projects and applications. Now, specific to OmniServer, um, given, the, given the nature of OmniServer um, and the way it works with devices, um, Obviously, we need a protocol document of some sort. Now, whether that's a PDF, um, which tends to be the case most days, um, or if you've got a hard copy manual, you can send us screenshots or scans of, um, or even if you just have the, the, the make and model of the device so we can go out and do some research. Um, uh, that, that a lot of times will allow us to find the protocol information that we need. And um, we can do a review of that information and let you know hey, this is gonna be a good fit for OmniServer, um, which is gonna be the case most of the time. Um, or if there's something really, really wonky or super complex about a protocol, um, we might say, no, that's not the best fit, but we can give you another alternative potentially. Um, protocol samples, um, we include a lot of sample protocols with OmniServer. Um, for simple protocols, it is sometimes possible for us to provide a basic sample to help users get started. Um, 
um, as well as um, we also offer success assurance services for OmniServer, um, where we can quote professional services um, to help fully complete a protocol or to provide a reference sample um, that where we would do part of the work um, and an engineer either um, with the integration firm or the end user can potentially take that reference sample and use it to finish building out the protocol uh, based off of any other um, commands um, or messages that might be um, available in that particular protocol. So basically just talk to us. Um, there's a lot we can do with the solutions that we have and there's a lot we can help you with um, to get started. Um, now with that, <laughs> Bring up the uh, bring up some resources here um, on where you can find case studies, um, free trials, um, product brochures for our solutions, um, how to contact John and myself, um, or to um, if if you if you'd like to see more than we had a chance to go into today due to the limited time, um, you can reach out um, via the information here to schedule a virtual lunch and learn, and uh, we can do some deeper dives um, for you based off of what piqued your interest and in what you might be interested in and in seeing more about. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm looking at the Q and A, don't see any questions yet, but if there are questions, pop them in the Q and A. Um, Sandra and Lisa will drag us off the Zoom at promptly at uh, 11 a.m. Central, but uh, we'll answer those. Kevin, I had one, you know, you configured the Omni server. Can you talk a little more about, you know, this? What if you have a lot of items or a lot of devices to configure? Um, what tools are there for it, it for scalability of that configuration? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, OmniServer supports CSV import um, and export uh, for items, for topics, um, even for your protocol messages um, that allow you to do bulk edits um, in, a, in a Excel potentially um, for mass adding tags and topics and protocol messages um, and things of that nature. And then you can just re-import those CSV files into OmniServer um, and be good to go. Um, so that, that makes it a little more scalable for your larger protocols. Sure, sure. And then if somebody needs, you know, is doing a big application or an integrator say has built a protocol for a device they encounter often, what's there for, to, to help the integrator with being able to reuse that? Yeah, well, that's the one that that's one of the huge benefits to OmniServer is that all of the protocols that are created um, are modular; they're reusable. Um, there's a DPD file format for every single protocol that gets created. Um, OmniServer supports um, has export ability to export that file out. You take it to another OmniServer, um, and then you can re-import that into that OmniServer and uh, use it the same as you did in the original OmniServer where it was cre originally created. And, and since our audience are integrators, you know, they, they, they might not want users to be messing with those protocol files, um, especially at 3 a.m. Um, there's something yeah. there to help them, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for protocols where you've configured it, you don't want the user in there mucking around and deleting things, adding things that shouldn't be in there. Um, you can password protect protocols um, so that in order to make any changes to that protocol, you have to know the password and you have to enter that password. Um, in order to have edit capabilities on the protocol. So off topic, we've had some questions over here about, you know, your singing and, um, you know, what's your favorite karaoke song? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I know anything, you have a few. Yeah, you know, anything Sinatra, um, anything 80s hair bands, uh, Motley Crue, Poison, uh, Counting Crows. Uh, I, I got a pretty diverse uh, selection of karaoke repertoire. <laughs> so there you have it. If CSA ever I ever wants to, do, you know, live band karaoke, Ke Kevin will, will will be glad to help instigate, and I, I'll I'll be helping him. Well, that's something to look forward to in the uh, in the next executive conference in Denver. I'm going to go start googling karaoke bars right now. Um, <laughs> So it looks like this is kind of, we're winding up here with the presentation. Sandra's got a slide or two that she's going to put up sure. for me and we will take it on home. All righty. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, yeah, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, on behalf of CSIA, I would like to thank Kevin and John for this informative discussion. I'd also like to thank Software Toolbox for sponsoring this event. And of course, thank you for attending. 
I'd also like to remind you that a recording will be available for viewing within the next couple of days and be sure to bookmark the CSIA events calendar so you don't miss any upcoming events. This concludes our program for today. Once again, thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thanks everyone. <laughs>